good afternoon, or if you go to school here, good morning. My name is <laughs> Ricky Van. <laughs> My name is Ricky Van Veen. I graduated from Wake Forest uh, ten years ago in 2003, and it's amazing to be back. So thanks for having me. Um, what I'm here to talk about today is how new media is changing in a social world, and the one human characteristic that's driving all of that. But first, some context as to my background in this area. Uh, this was me in college. As you can tell, I thought I was pretty cool, uh, but I, I was not. I decided to come to Wake Forest for two reasons. The first reason, when I was touring the campus uh, when I was in high school, there was a Taco Bell on campus. <laughs> and the second reason was that you got a free laptop. I arrived my freshman year uh, of college, and the Taco Bell was gone. And I was devastated. Uh, but I did get a lot of use out of the laptop. Um, when I was a freshman, I made a website in my dorm room called College Humor. This is an early screenshot of the site. Uh, if you look carefully, it has a warning to, quote, parents and people over 32. that basically says, go away, which is really funny to me now, being a 32-year-old. Um, but within a couple of years after we started it, College Humor became the biggest comedy website in the world. Uh, this is some of our stats at, at present day. College Humor spawned a, an apparel line called Busted Tees. We started a video sharing site called Vimeo. And then in 2006, we put those companies together and sold them to a bigger company called IAC. And I still work at IAC today, and I oversee College Humor and our new companies that, we, that we're starting all the time. College Humor has grown from just its core website. We now do live tours, books, TV shows. We have a feature film coming out later this year. So it's really grown out of that center. Um, but back to my main point, everybody knows that media is changing, right? Old media to new media. And that's not anything that you're going to hear for the first time today. Here's a chart of declining newspaper revenue if you need a visual. Um, but what you might not be as aware of are the changes within new media itself. So to illustrate these changes, I've brought with me two videos today. The first is College Humor's biggest video from 2007, and the second is College Humor's biggest video from 2012. The 2007 video is called Realistic Hollywood Sex Scene. The title is pretty self-explanatory. First of all, I don't know if I should show this in Wait Chapel, but... Uh, <laughs> It's basically a, uh, a parody of those Nicholas Sparks movies like The Notebook, where, um, but, but they're done how people actually have awkward, fumbly sex. So, uh, so let's play a little clip from that now. I told you never to come here. You told me lots of things. What? Hang, hang on. Hang on. What? I'm still wearing a sock. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> that's that video. Uh, the second video is from 2012, and it's called Gay Men Will Marry Your Girlfriends. It's a, it's a pro-gay marriage parody PSA, and I will show that now. Americans are becoming more comfortable with the idea of gay marriage, seeing it as both a moral and civil rights issue. But there are many out there who are still fighting against the cause. And as gay men ourselves, we would just like to say to those people, fine, keep marriage between a man and a woman. And in response, we will marry your girlfriends. We'll marry your girlfriends. What? You don't think we could? We'd be the best husbands ever. Have you seen us? We are ripped. All of us are ripped. It doesn't seem statistically possible, and yet it's true. Because we love going to the gym. And you know who else loves going to the gym? Your girlfriend. <laughs> so, so you may think that the timing of these videos' popularity is arbitrary, but I don't think it is. Uh, things have changed a lot just within the past five years. Let me explain why. So, back when the first video came out, people would consume content online differently. 
Maybe they'd, they'd go out and find it on their own. Maybe they'd go to a portal like Yahoo and they'd just click around. Or they'd go to a search engine and just type in random words. In fact, for a few years, if you typed in the word sex on Google, the first thing to come up was a realistic Hollywood sex scene. Uh, and that sent a lot of traffic our way. I'm guessing most of that traffic was 10-year-olds because I don't know who types sex into Google. <laughs> but it was a lot of traffic nonetheless. Um, so back then, people would find a piece of content they liked and maybe they would forward it in an email or they would call some coworkers over to their desk. But that was really the extent of their relationship with that piece of content. But now things are different. Content is distributed socially. That could be on Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter. Somebody's relationship with a piece of content is no longer just as a consumer. It's often now a consumer and an evangelist. And being an evangelist isn't that hard. It's just one or two clicks. And that's made the media distribution system go from one to many, or a broadcast model, to many to many, which is often called peer to peer. But let's talk about sharing on general on the internet we should establish that some things are inherently more shareable than others. There are two types of clicks online, a social click and a personal click. And that was taught to me by my friend Jonah Peretti, who runs a site called BuzzFeed. Something like porn will have a high number of personal clicks, but not a lot of shares. People don't normally tend to share the porn they're watching with their friends and family. <laughs> Something like uh, nonprofits or causes has a high level of shares. People like to show everyone how charitable they are, but a low number of clicks. People don't tend to click on it. Uh, another interesting thing here is specific cultural experience, which is a cousin of nostalgia. Um, people love to share nostalgia. For my generation, it's saved by the bell. If you have a picture of A.C. Slater on your Facebook, people are going to like it and share it. Um, tempting to share has become the new tempting to click. And as sharing increases between trusted friends, we'll see a decline in misleading links, people ending up at places they don't want to be uh, with disappointing results. A couple years ago, I noticed a trend on sites like Huffington Post. When a headline would ask a question, the answer to the question would always be no. Is the last stand a good career move for Arnold? No, it wasn't. Is New Zealand going cat free? No, it's not. Uh, does Obama really want Romney to win? No, I'm guessing he didn't. Um, <laughs> but these, they, these are tricks to get you to click uh, to make you curious. I later found out this is something called Betteridge's Law, named after Ian Betteridge, a British technology journalist. And it shows why people prefer to get content recommended to them by friends instead of clicking somewhat misleading links. But back to the why behind why content is getting shared. I believe people share content online for one reason and one reason only, and that's identity creation. So what is identity creation? Well, identity creation is how people share things online and how they create an identity for themselves, how they seem to the outside world by what they post. And why is identity creation an important thing to understand? Well, we've established that social sharing drives the popularity of something. And since identity creation drives sharing, if we can understand identity creation, we can find out and often predict what will make something popular. And that's important not just for people like me with jobs in media, but for anybody here who has something they want to promote or get out into the world. Every website or service that you see on here was built on the back of identity creation. Some are more permanent than others. Uh, Jason Kotke is a well-known blogger and very well-respected. And he said this when talking about Twitter. He said, Twitter feels like continually moving to New York City without knowing anyone, whereas Facebook feels like you're living in your hometown and hanging out with everyone you went to high school with. On Twitter, you don't have any of that Facebook baggage, the peer pressure from a lifetime of friends holding you back. You are who your last dozen tweets say you are. And that's such an important thing to understand. Because what you share online is who you are online. And since online is now you know, where we find out about things, that's basically who you are. When you share a piece of media, 
you're creating an identity for yourself. And content becomes a bumper sticker. If you think about the gay marriage PSA, if you post that to your Facebook page, you're telling everyone that you know, hey, this is where I stand on this issue. So let's look at this example. Both of these articles are about the same exact study with the same exact data. But one is clearly going to be shared by people who want everyone to know that they're vegetarian. And the other one is going to be shared by, every, by people who want everybody to know that they think vegetarians are boring. And if there's more of one group, that article is going to get shared more. So what we're seeing here is content living or dying based on how people can use it to say something about themselves. This is another example of identity creation at work. This photo was taken at the inaugural ball about a month ago. And you'll notice everybody in the crowd, instead of standing mere feet from the president and first lady, taking it in with their own eyes, they're looking into the back of their little camera or the back of their iPhone, their shaky little screen. Now, why are they doing that? Well, it's not to document the event, because there are going to be thousands of photos of much better quality online within minutes. They're doing it because they want to post it online to their friends and say, hey, look where I am right now. And this leads me to propose this. Identity creation will become such a strong force that in the future, documentation will lead experience instead of the other way around, like it's always been. Let me explain. In the past, you'd do something. Say you'd go on a trip, and the photos or videos you'd take would be a byproduct of that. And now I see that being flipped around with young people. I'll give you some examples. A guy deciding to get a second wind and go out to a bar because he's really this close to, getting the, to becoming the mayor of that bar on Foursquare. Or a girl saying, high school girl saying, should I go to homecoming? Well, the photos would look great on my Facebook page. Or something I'm sure a lot of us can identify with. Uh, should, I, should I go to this concert? Well, I know my ex-girlfriend still follows me on Instagram and it would make her really jealous. This is a big change in how people are making decisions, and it just shows the extent to which identity creation has seeped into our lives. Now, there are a few byproducts of this ecosystem that we should be aware of. The first is called Bring Your Own Audience, and this was noticed first by Ryan Holiday, who's a media writer in New York. It used to be that a media outlet would bestow attention on a subject, and now it's quite often the other way around. For example, a magazine wouldn't do a story on an actor unless the actor can send the magazine enough attention and traffic from his own social media. And it's a very interesting relationship. The magazine or the publication contributes legitimacy, and the subject contributes the eyeballs. The second is a decline in hard news. It used to be that you would buy one newspaper and it would be bundled together, the hard news and the soft news. The hard news being the politics, the politics, the international, and the soft news being the entertainment, the fashion. But now all of that is separated. And because people don't tend to share hard news as much, you don't often see people tweeting out recaps of city council meetings, um, the hard news is declining because people aren't seeing it as much. And so, if you're in the media, you're not going to make as much of it. Uh, as media gets more social, we need to be aware of information insulation, meaning if you're friends with a group of people who already think like you, then you're not going to be exposed to many new ideas if you're just getting your stories from them. And there's a TED talk about filter bubbles that goes very deep into this. The third is speed over quality. In the beginning of the web, there was this kind of utopian vision that the internet would be a bastion of accurate information and the truth would rise to the top. But unfortunately, that's not exactly what we've seen happen. Why? Well, two reasons. One, on the internet, speed is rewarded over quality. Uh, speed is rewarded over accuracy. If you're the first, first to publish something, you have the best chance of your story being the one that gets shared all around. And two, when's the last time you saw somebody share a correction? As we've established, nowadays, if it doesn't get shared, it's not going to be seen. This is my favorite example of speed over quality. This is a story from MTV.com about the late Whitney Houston having some personal health problems. They wanted to get, out, get it out as fast as possible, so 
They quickly scoured Twitter for an opinion you know, instead of going to an expert. And uh, this was the result. This is 100% uh, real, by the way. Um, Good luck to you, Whitney. This is not an easy disease to kick. Be strong, tweeted dog fart. <laughs> I first saw that years ago, and it still makes me laugh every time I see it. Uh, so how long will these trends continue? Well, it's tough to say media evolves pretty quickly, and technology evolves even more quickly. And technology usually has a way of working out kinks in the system. But social media's influence has brought one drastic and awesome change to media. Media has become more of a meritocracy than it's ever been. And that's a very good thing, and it hasn't always been the case. On College Humor, while there are always exceptions, we'll know if something's going to go viral and be a hit, usually within the first half hour, from one statistic alone, the number of people who have shared it with their friends. And that gives me a lot of confidence that whoever the guy or girl is on this campus, slaving away in their dorm room at some great idea, that that great idea will find success and be seen. And I think that's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs>